Hello, everybody. My name is Joel Filderman, and welcome to the Dog Trainers Connection. I am not a dog trainer, but these other people you see here are. We get together, we discuss a topic, come up with some thoughts, sometimes some answers, always have an interesting discussion. And, uh, but uh, it's always a, uh, as I said, an interesting discussion. So, um, Today's topic, um, well, Valerie, this is your topic. Um, you wanted to discuss today about dog culture. You want to discuss about the changes in dog culture that you've been seeing. And you said um, that uh, you want to blame it on people, but uh, you're sh very sure it's not that... Yeah, no, I know, but you're sure it's not that simple is what you said. Uh, and you, you see extremely skilled handlers ha having these issues as well. Uh, you you say that somehow it's a piece of broken dog culture, uh, that people want to bring their guardian breed dogs everywhere, uh, that um, dogs weren't bred to do certain things, but people are trying to get them to do things. Um, so... I've said my piece. Why don't you tell us what you feel dog culture is and what it is you're saying that you think is broken? Uh, so for me, dog culture is how the canine human relationship is functioning within a certain time period as mm -hmm. people and dogs move forward through how our culture changes. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of changes in culture with technology and the pandemic and yeah, sure. the differences in how families are run. So the things that you presented that I mentioned are sort of a, a mishmash mm -hmm. of examples sure. that for me fall into a lot of dogs and dog culture ending up with a lot of dogs being faced with being a square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm because uh, people in general, in our current dog culture, I'm talking about people that are not, there's a lot of people that are still maintaining a dog culture that is very natural. They're mm -hmm. running dogs on farms. They are running dogs in sports. They are honoring the breeds they own or the qualities of the mixed breeds they've acquired and owned sure. um, by understanding what kinds of dogs they have. But we also see many dogs that are become almost becoming either anthropomorphized. We have a sure. I don't know how many billion dollar industry in dog clothes in this country. Dog clothes mm. that mimic people clothes. Yeah. Um, the we have dogs that are unsuitable outside of their bred for environments being shoehorned into urban settings. Livestock mm -hmm. guardian breeds. From Great Pyrenees to Kangles to Akbashes, I saw a litter of seven Asian Caucasian, I'm saying it backwards, Caucasus Asian shepherds, which mm -hmm. are, I didn't say that quite clearly, but they're an Akbash in one country and a, they're very high top tier predator killing livestock guardian dogs that live outside. They don't live in homes. They don't bond with groups of people. And so a rescue, a local rescue brought seven of them in to be distributed to the local community. And yeah. we're pretty suburban here. There's no forking farms. They are bred to guard small, you know, on the sides of mountains with right. sheep and one shepherd. And then we see a lot of Malinois being brought into homes. And then a lot of really, really, as dog trainers, I'm seeing a lot of really unsuitable matches and rescue where families are being faced with dogs that bite and mm -hmm. have illness and aggression issues. And I'm trying regularly to figure out where did this disconnect where we have so many dysfunctional dogs now that we've got resorting to medicating them instead of training them. Yes. Instead of, you know, we used to occasionally medicate a dog in conjunction with training or mm -hmm. have a dog who's got an actual serious mental disability but the numbers they just simply far exceed the possibility of that many dogs being born with mental disabilities that require sure. medication 
And um, I have used meds for a personal dog of my own. I am not saying it, it should never happen. Right. But I just see dogs being in many ways dis dishonored or disrespected for who they actually are. Mm -hmm. And not because people deliberately do it, but because our culture is pushing our society is pushing a culture of not sure. acknowledging what dogs are where did they come from how did we co-evolve yeah how did we create each other yeah and to be honest with you, the scariest numbers are i collect dog bite and dog fatality statistics and they are skyrocketing in this country mm -hmm. in this country we have tons of people stressed by reactive dogs on leash sure and um afraid to take their dogs anywhere because they, anywhere that it would be natural to take a dog because there are so many people unable to control their animals right. and then taking them places where they're not actually allowed to take them yeah. and creating a different kind of scenario. So that's a whole lot of yeah. singular observations sure. that make me have a big question about where did this disconnect happen? Why? Are we not having healthy, well-bred dogs, even rescue dogs? I mean, I had rescue dogs all my life. Mm -hmm. They came from the shelter, they came from a farm, or they came from hand-me-down puppies from the shop, on the shop, right? But they were all functional animals with within a family and within the outdoor mm -hmm. activities we did with them and the sports we did with them. Yeah. I could go on and on. I, I'm just, I'm not seeing one clear answer. But the first thing is I think that we've, we've created a culture concerning dogs where they're here only to support our needs right. without figuring out how what, are we going to support theirs in the same time. And also what they were, what they were originally bred for and what they're supposed right. to be doing. I mean, it reminds me, Steve, of my fate, one of my favorite stories of yours about the people saying, oh, chows were bred to protect the, the children. And you said, yeah, well, they were pr protected the, the children of the emperor, but it was through, you know, many closed doors and they weren't in the room with the little kid. So how much of this, Steve, is, is miscommunication? How much of this is is people just looking to profit off of that miscommunication or that misrepresentation? Well, I don't know. It's, you know, like, I hate to use this term, but, you know, it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> it is complicated. It's complicated because, you know, some folks obtain dogs based on their appearance only. Mm hmm with no thought to the needs of the individual breed type. They don't know what they're getting into. They just like the way it looks. Mm -hmm. sure. And they buy or obtain dogs based on, uh, certainly in the purebred dogs, you know, I mean, we've all dealt with people who are like, well, he's gonna be 200 pounds when he grows up, you know? Oh, he's this color or that color, or look at his head. You know, it becomes about confirmation and color and size and all the things that don't matter you know it, it's about the character of the dogs you know and so um i forget if it was james or pal or maybe it was colpinger you know it's like why don't we just breed dogs that make good pets you know why are we so hell-bent on breeding functional dogs when a lot of the functions that we were breeding dogs for once upon a time no longer exist mm. Right? It's like the guy who used to take the money at the toll booth. There's none of that anymore, you know. It's <laughs> easy to pass, and off you go, you know, right? There's, right. Somebody yeah. lost a job. There's a lot of dog breeds that have lost their job. Not their fault, but it's it's gone. You know, there's no job. So what are you going to do with the dog? It's got a work ethic and no job. If, if you leave it in your house, you know, it becomes a problem. It'll find something to do all right, but you won't be happy with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. people are not educated. Some people, I don't think really want to be educated. Mm -hmm. like, uh, they just, they have their, whatever it costs to bring the animal in. They, it, they make it about money. There's a lot of like problems. You know, I don't think that any of the registries are helpful. You know, they're not no. necessarily hurtful, but they're not helpful. You know, listen, I, I, I mean, some years ago, I had this talk with the AKC 
at the Westminster, they got that big, long AKC table. I, I might have mentioned this before. And, and you know, I was complaining about the, the city ordinance to not sell puppies from stores unless they were sterilized. Mm. So people are buying like little French bulldogs that were sterilized at eight weeks old and things like that. It, it really grossed me out. So I, I, I went to the, the people in charge of legislation who were there at that show. And they really didn't have a lot of answers. They said, we're a very small department and we can't watch all the towns, the cities, the counties. They all have their own thing. And I'm like, well, but you're the AKC. You know, you got money. You should be the ones that can do these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they, they just kind of, they had no real answer. Shrugged their shoulders. And then right behind me was the sign with the Black Russian Terriers, you know. So I asked them if they know anything about the dog behind me. And they, there's a sign that says Black Russian Terriers. And they went, yeah, they're Black Russian Terriers. And I was like, yeah, okay, what else do you know? And they're like, uh, mm. that's, all, that's what we know. And I'm like, you know, I mean, I don't have time. I, don't, I, you know, I won't live long enough to study all the breeds and all the origins. But, you know, just because when the Black Russian Terriers kind of came around, I started, I looked it up a little bit and I found them to be dogs bred for the military, by the military, for the military, how they got out of the hands of the Russian military, I don't know. And mm -hmm. then they ended up in Westminster and then like pretty good looking. Wow. And now they're getting paraded on TV and people are like, wow, what a handsome dog. Oh, I'd <laughs> love to have that. I, I mean, I talked to a veterinarian once who tried to hire me to work with her black Russian terrier. I asked her if she had children. She said, yes, I do. I said, aren't you a little concerned? And she got angry with me. I never heard from her again. She got mm. mad. Now, I've had clients that were not just clients of hers, but friends who told me that when their children went to her house, they had to lock the dog up. Wow. Of course they did. You know, yeah. but she got that puppy in her mind. This was a social, friendly, very doable breed of dog for her family. She's a veterinarian. They, I'm talking the AKC. You yeah. know, these are people who are supposed to kind of know and they don't. So how are we supposed to have a healthy dog culture sure. when there's so much disease involved, right? Where do you go mm -hmm. to clean it up? There's no like hospital for this stuff. Hmm. Can I, can I, I just wanna respond go. to one thing that, um, actually I could respond to a lot of stuff, but I don't wanna monopolize time. The, the idea that dogs have lost their jobs, but they haven't lost their evolution. We have dogs that are, or, you know, that come out of the, I'm an ethologist. I really, really, really study wild canid behavior to understand why our dogs, how we've specialized our dogs and chosen the genetics of their wild ancestors to specialize into retrievers, specialize into protection, specialize into noses, specialize into service dogs. That's that the most of those breeds, the basis for them are hundreds if not thousands of years old so mm -hmm. i'm going to use the great dane as an example and the german shepherd or Al alsace dog the, those particular dogs are between four and six hundred years old with really uh purpose-bred genetics before them before they popped out as this particular breed bred for boar hunting protection man trailing to catch criminals or slaves or servants that tried to run away and war dogs in the in the case of the of the Great Danes, and then what was the other one I said I was going to use for? Oh, the German Shepherd. German Shepherd again, guardian breeds, right? Guardian breeds, strong, supposed to chase off predators. Not a livestock guardian dog, also meant to be loyal and people friendly uh, to the extent that the person is trying to do something invasive on the property. The dog is mm -hmm. watching livestock and over. Now they've. There's been a movement in the past 20 years or so to create couch potato Great Danes right. and house pet shepherds. And between the AKC's changing standards, which have immensely messed up the structure of German shepherds with the slope back too much, let's make the legs go up, let's create a roach because the spine can't keep up with the legs coming back up. What a mess. And we all see the anxious mess that happens when we're trying to unravel four to a thousand four hundred to ten hundred years or more or thousands of years of purpose cho purpose chosen purpose bred 
dogs for those jobs into couch potatoes. We have anxious messes that have Mm -hmm. bad bowels, bad guts, bad structure, bad temperaments. And nobody is paying attention to the idea that the dog used to have a different kind of job. How can I fulfill that? My Great Danes do jobs that are designed, games that are job designed to replicate their jobs. For Great Danes, so, sure. Oh, 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 the ones that, so the same with the shepherds we train. I have three mouths. I'm not taking them jumping out of helicopters. I'm not going to be Halle Berry in a movie for practicing 70 hours a day for six months to make that movie to choose to bring that kind of a dog into my house with small children. Right. They do games and they do training and they do all kinds of things that are fulfilling for their breed without them having to be shepherds in Belgium or guardian right. and watching things and or even doing protection sports or military work or police work that's the things those are some of the things that these dogs are bred for today one of my mouths is search and rescue bred we're working on everything to do with nose with her Mm -hmm. i it is possible to not degrade the breeding into anxiety to remove the drives we don't want to work with people need to understand where the i think in my opinion that it would be really helpful if people stop pushing the fur baby agenda and started mm-hmm. talking about the domesticated predators living in our homes that are lacking the jobs they were gene- are their jobs only disappeared in the last 20 30 years yeah we have sure. less farming yeah. we we yeah. have app cameras for security all manner of you know things and the yeah. idea that these dogs should grow up with zero zero stresses from the time they're puppies i went off the topic the only thing i was trying to talk about was that i don't think we can degrade the breeding to solve the problem of no jobs i think that we need to find ways to teach people how to fulfill the breeding and i have people who have high drive dogs who are completely disabled and can train and fulfill their dogs from the seat in their living room because Mm -hmm. there are are games and methods we can do to accomplish that yeah no i think I, I grew up I grew up with German shepherds like everybody my age had a German shepherd as a child it was the breed of the day yeah um so my experience I mean it's not my breed currently but it was a breed I grew up with and you know I, I was 15 and the dog was 14 when he was put down so literally we grew up together um so I can tell you that having watched German shepherds over the last several decades, not going to share my own age, but over the last several decades. Um, so what has what I have seen happen in that breed and with other protection breeds is genetics will have out, but genetics are not just the thing that you see, that you see a protective dog or you see a dog with this structure. There's way more to their genetics than that. Sure. And what people seem to have forgotten is that nothing happens in a vacuum. Mm. So if I'm trying to breed for a softer temperament, not necessarily, you know, a golden retriever style dog out of a right. German shepherd, but a softer temperament, a less dominant dog, a less aggressive dog, but in selecting for less aggression, what else is coming along with that? Mm. So, um, the fox studies that they did in Russia are, for me, you know, they selected purely on temperament. These foxes were friendly to people and allowed people to interact with them. Those foxes were super aggressive and didn't allow people to interact with them. The ones that were a little bit friendly were selected, bred, get friendlier and friendlier foxes. There was a separate colony of the aggressive foxes. They got more and more, more aggressive. More aggressive, sure. Now, today... 50 generations later, those foxes still exist in Russia. The ones that were tame, that were friendly, are now like dogs. They're very friendly. They also have drop ears. They don't have like normal upright fox ears. Mm -hmm. And they have white patches on their coats. None of those things were selected for. Those came with the softer temperaments. So the the more aggressive I'm I'm sorry, what did you say, Valerie? They look like puppies. I I dropped it. Yeah, they, they, they... They've taken on the characteristics of puppies as okay, right. they, they dematured so, their 
presence. I'm sorry, Pam, I didn't mean to That's okay. So the point is though, that when you go to select one thing, if your breeding program is based around one thing, mm -hmm. there are other things that are gonna change along with that. Sure. And so it seems to me, I don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. I only know what's happening in this country. We've been rather confined for the last several years. Mm. Um, in this country, we have completely anthropomorphized dogs. Dogs yeah. are fur babies. Dogs are, there was a time when it was very normal for breeders to have a hundred dogs on site mm -hmm. of all ages from puppyhood to the seniors and everything in between. And that hundred dogs was the last 10 years of their breeding program. Mm -hmm. And they knew their dogs. They knew that this line here, that this dog came from that dog. They mature slowly. They're going to be better at X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. This line over here, because they watched their dogs grow out and they yep. had them forever. Today, breeders typically, I only breed once every five or 10 years when I want something for myself. That's the responsible way to do it. I don't want all these puppies out in the world. And then they can't keep dogs for the long term because we have HOAs and municipalities and things that put limit laws. And you mm -hmm. can only have two animals in your house. And if one of them's a goldfish, well, you have a choice. You can have a dog or a cat, but you can't have more than that because mm -hmm. that's animals. Right. Um, so with that in mind, that has changed a lot of going all the way back to the breeders, never mind the pet owners. The breeders don't know their dogs the way breeders did at one time. Mm -hmm. They don't know that when they hit three years or five years or seven years that X, Y, Z is going to happen because by then they've rehomed them. They've had a litter or two with their girl or their boy has sired a litter or two. And then they've rehomed them because they need to make room for the next generation. So they don't really know their dogs the way breeders used to. Mm -hmm. And because they don't know their dogs, they can't tell us about their dogs. So that culturally has changed. Wow. The idea that, you know, I was at the detection dog conference from, that AKC put on um, in August down in North Carolina. And the reason that all these vendors have to go overseas for all their dogs is because there is no critical mass of dogs in this country. There's no one place that they can go and I need 10 dogs to fill this contract. Well, they can't drive around to 10 states to get 10 dogs. They just don't have time for that. Mm. Overseas, there are still breeders who maintain colonies of dogs, yep. who maintain large numbers of dogs in training. So that's why the vendors go there. But I think our culture in this country about dogs and seeing dogs as fur babies, as yes. seeing our food source, where does our food come from? Oh, it comes from little styrofoam trays with cellophane wrapping on it. Right. There's no animals attached to that. Children don't, I mean, we as a culture, we barely know, children barely understand where babies come from anymore, never mind where animals really come from and the lifestyles. That nature in general. Yeah. 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 We've lost contact with nature. So I mm -hmm. think that's a big piece of the puzzle mm. for me. Mm -hmm. And Bonnie, we were talking, we, we were talking about this earlier about the fact that is this a case of that there needs to be a balance between the way things were and the way things are. Uh, do we need to at least understand some of that past in order to be able to deal with what's going on now and perhaps change it? Yeah, well, it's, I think one of the reasons it's hard to change is the focus on the, the fur baby mentality mm -hmm. and also the corporate money mentality mm -hmm. of things being pushed um you know as valerie was saying drugs being pushed on dogs as as a fix uh for mm -hmm. a behavioral problem um i and I the just, selling of dogs that aren't necessarily dogs that should be in somebody's and, home yes yeah. and and the whole scale um, you know, I personally don't know all that much about puppy mills, but they can't be, you know, I mean, maybe some of them successfully breed a nice dog. And if the person gets the dog out as a puppy, but it, it, I'm not sure what goes on there. 
and and you know mistreating the dogs and the amount of breedings and um i think i, I don't think we had those years and years ago and nope. and 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 people took more responsibility yeah we heard about dogs getting out and biting people and running loose but i don't know lately it seems that when that happens yeah. He, people don't want to take responsibility for it. They, they're, 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 dogs just keep getting loose. Well, wait a minute. Did, at the first time it happened, can't you figure out how to manage that? Hmm. And 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 what's going on in your life that that you can't manage that, and make sure that it doesn't happen again? Or I mean, accidents happen, but it just seems like more and more things happen with dogs. Right more off leash you know dogs charging up and biting your dog and mm -hmm. or attacking the person and i i don't remember it being like that yeah there, there were incidents of course and you'd hear about it and a kid being bitten but it just seems to be you know which i think is part of that broken culture that that valerie's talking about when when we were kids bonnie if a dog bit yeah did anybody ever like when I was a kid, it was what did you do to the dog? Why did yep. you make mm. the dog bite you? Yes. It, the blame was on the child and mm. that you shouldn't have been doing that. You should have left the dog alone, that sort yeah. of thing. Today it's, oh, well, you know, you were there and my dog and Fluffy is blah, blah, blah. And he's got a bad attitude. And, and, you know, you were wearing green and he doesn't like green. You shouldn't wear green around Fluffy, um, which is, mm -hmm. you know, we, we avoid doing the things that trigger dogs, mm -hmm. how people live their lives. They walk on eggshells around dogs today. And we Very have anthrop anthropomorphized dogs to the point where we want everything to live. Right. We think that because there's people walking around with these issues that it's that it's okay for dogs to walk around with these issues. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Again, when I was growing up, dogs with poor temperaments did not make it to adulthood. We yeah. didn't coddle the dogs. We didn't try and keep them around forever. People didn't yeah. make excuses for their dogs. Exactly. And I, look, yeah. I was in high school. I went away to college. My dog bit my parents three times. I had a German Shepherd that bit my family three times the first semester I was gone. I got to come home from college to put my dog to sleep. Mm -hmm. mm. People don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't hear those stories anymore. They hear about, mm. I hear about dogs that have gotten one more pass after their fifth or sixth bite. And now they get medicated. Mm. And that's no life for the dog. So I think we tolerate a lot more. No, yeah. it is no life for the person either. Right. No. And, you, and you used to see muzzles too. I know. Think about you know you'd have you'd see dogs well, now it's with a bad basket connotation. muzzles. It, it looks it looks look you know people don't want to see that they think you know your dog must be terrible and blah 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 and yeah right. So David, how much of it is that perception? I think a lot of that is you know and I think I think it's we do it to ourselves we're our own worst enemy in a roundabout way. It's if you walk down the street with a dog that has a, a muzzle on. Not always, but a lot of times the people that are looking at your dog probably think, oh, my God, what that dog must be vicious or this or that. Mm -hmm. In reality, maybe the dog is aggressive, but it, it's just fear, it's anxiety, what have you. But it could also be maybe the dog forges things off the ground it shouldn't be eating. Mm -hmm. Right. It could be something as simple as that. Um, and the way I look at it, at least it's, it's protecting the dog. Let The dog has less stress this way. And in a roundabout way, it's protecting other people around them because mm -hmm. this way that dog is going to get hopefully a little bit of space. The other, the yeah. other people are walking their dog mm -hmm. is going to keep a, keep a yeah. distance. Unless but they still have the that owner. attitude like, oh, what did you do to your dog or your dog is this or that? Yeah. You know, they either say that or you can, you know, a lot of times that they're, they're thinking those kind of things, hmm. mm -hmm. you know, but, but I, you know, kind of changing subjects a little bit. I read an interesting article uh, recently, you know, talking about, you're getting back to the business of things and things like that, where we're just marketing things, towards what we want as opposed right. to what the dog's needs are. And for instance, where you see the raised um, cup holder or food, food and bowl and food and water holders, right? They're raised up. So you, you typically would say, okay, for a larger dog, they're taller. So maybe they need something raised. Well, really from what I've read, it makes a lot of sense. The opposite is true really. Cause what can end up happening is they they found a lot of dogs that are they're going to be breed dogs. They can get bloat. 
which obviously we all know that's a, a uh. deadly potential thing. And they, they theorize what happens. They're not sure. They hypothesize is that there, a lot of air is getting into their airway mm. and that's compromising things. So between that and something else. So they say it's rare. You know, if you think about it, going back to ancestors that we're talking about from year, years and years of uh, genetics and so forth, they forage on the that's where they did. They forage on the ground. Right. It's not natural for a dog, small or large, to go up higher. So the only exception would be might be if, if the dog has some issues in the head or neck area, things like that, so arthritis, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but generally speaking, most dogs just, you know, eat from the bowl on, on the, on the ground, you know, okay. um, another thing in terms of marketing, you know, we all got, I don't know how long it's been, 10, 15, 20 years when we all got involved with grain free, gluten free, well, a lot of these kind of health terms and coins and all this, and that stuff, that kind of thing is now into the dogs, right? Yep. Grain free. And, and my understanding about it, I don't have limited understanding, but nine times out of 10, there's nothing wrong with having grains in a dog diet. There are some exceptions where, you know, things like that, just like a human. But from my understanding, it, it, it doesn't mean it's more of a marketing thing. It could mm -hmm. be grain free. Don't get me wrong, but it's more marketing in terms of, of it, like being bad for a dog per se, having, having grains. So mm -hmm. it's totally marketing when they've replaced the calories that the dog needs from the protein and fat with legumes. And then we, I feed raw mostly, and when I do feed kibble or recommend kibble, it's a very low carbohydrate kibble, but it also has to not be full of legumes that are making the protein and fat content that is usable by the dog falsely elevated. There's mm -hmm. a lot of marketing and all of that, and it's yeah. about mm -hmm. money. It is not about the dogs. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, um, and I, yeah, and I, I think, and I correct me, well, any of you, that if I'm, I'm wrong, but I think I've read also that um, there has been some, you know, some of the major um, retailers, such as like, I'm not saying they, they, the ones I'm mentioning are, are the ones that are, are the ones that are um, doing this, but like a PetSmart, uh, Petco, those, those along those lines, they pay for a lot of these studies that are being done by the scientists coming out with the food and so forth. I mean, obviously, they can't put out a bad product that's going to kill a dog. Obviously, but but you know, you, you question whether is it is it um, the highest quality? Maybe it's just meeting the guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. The the base, just the minimum, the dogs for the dog to live and survive. But is it really giving the dog optimal nutrition? Mm -hmm. That you got to question, I think, in some of these in some of these cases. And if 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 whoever's studying them, they're going to say, well, oh, this, this food is terrible. Well, you just gave me all this money, and you're not, you know, it's kind of like. If I don't say something good, then you just gave me all the money. I'm not going to get any, any more any more money to do up to, to find other right. studies. So it's, it's yep, they have conflict of interest. Yeah, all over. Over. yeah, and yeah. then generally based on observations by owners who aren't scientists and not insufficient size um, pool of uh, subjects, non-controlled variables. There's a lot that's mm. wrong. Um, I, I have. It just come up in New York that we're now facing remote collar sales ban. It's not about using them; it's a sales ban. Mm -hmm. Wait, collars? I, I've heard about remote that. Yeah, collars. Yeah. Okay. They're calling them shock collars in the I bill. Know. So I the the wording is all terrible. The use, how they're used, and I actually I, I travel a lot with within Europe, and I have a lot of friends in Europe, and they have a lot of tool bans in Europe. And a bunch of friends of mine that are in Europe, as well as the United States, we all submitted to our group study the actual laws banning collars and the proposition of laws in New York State. And we're comparing the verbiage and it's all emotional. It's mm -hmm. all uh, not even like uh, one of the things I do like about the way our legislative process works is that we try to to really build laws that don't leave things up to vastly up to human interpretation outside the legislation. Right. So if you look at the law from Germany about the banning of remote collars, it literally states, and I'm not paraphrasing here because I didn't memorize it, but it states that you'll never use a remote shock collar or e-collar, whatever they use, electronic collar, I think is what they called it, in a way that substantially, that word is definitely in there, substantially limits a dog's choices to be able to move about and live properly and happily and healthily. Well, a leash can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. The um, 
the language does not say it, the, there's a tool ban saying that you can't use them this way, which is literally made it illegal to use them there. But anybody who reads that law knows the 7,500 holes and how it's worded. The way I use the remote collar doesn't limit anything about the dog's lifestyle. It opens it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've worked with it. I use extremely low levels. Humans can't even feel the level at which my dogs are working. And I only have one dog of mine that are currently alive now, but we can use these tools to heal dogs with fear because we're not attaching it to a leash that makes them feel trapped. They understand the context of tactile relationships. And for me, somebody interjected into a conversation that was from the IACP that nobody should use remote collars because they're a welfare issue. For me, the biggest two welfare issues that dogs are currently facing right now is the inability to stay in homes. So they're mm -hmm. being surrendered or abandoned. There's two in our town in the last couple of days that never found the owners. The dogs were found on the side of the road somewhere, ob obvious drop-offs mm -hmm. and overflowing shelters, immense amount of rescues, bringing dogs from overseas. Right. And then the poor quality of food used both in training. We got dogs full of, carbohydrates and fat mm -hmm. how many overweight unhealthy dogs do we see so between mm -hmm. obesity and surrender how much of that could be avoided if we keep dogs in homes by teaching people how to properly train their dogs how to understand who those dogs are how what are their drives how can we enjoy them how can we train them and instead of going straight to banned tools when you they absolutely don't understand how those tools work. Mm -hmm. They're not even called a shock collar. A shock collar, you know, Pet Smart or Pet, one of those pet stores is on the bandwagon with this because they stopped selling the right. hottest collars on the market from China, crap collars. Now they're like on the, oh, we're all social warriors for dogs mm -hmm. bandwagon. Well, and I think too, I think too, a big part of the problem has been you know, going back to the original concept of wrong dogs winding up in wrong homes kind of mm -hmm. thing. I think that um, the adopt, don't shop thing is a cultural thing. Yes. Going back to dog culture that people feel somehow that purchasing a dog, which by the way, is what you're doing, even at a shelter. Money is exchanging you hands. You and are it's, purchasing it's, a dog. Yeah. Um, but I think that that whole idea that you shouldn't purchase a dog, you should just, you know, go to a shelter and save a life and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And people go in and they just, oh, I felt bad for the dog, so trip. I brought it home. Oh, so it was emotional. hiding in the back of the kennel yeah. run and I felt bad, so I brought it home. Oh, it was climbing on top of all the other puppies, so clearly it wanted to come home with me, mm -hmm. so I brought it home. Right. So, there's a lot of wrong dogs in homes mm -hmm. and people are winding up with projects instead of pets. Mm. Nobody wants a project. Everybody wants a pet. Nobody wants a project. Nobody yep. wants the dog that I have to live through X number of steps and I have to do X number of things and whatever to make it easy to live with. It may right. never be easy to live with. You may mm -hmm. always have to manage that animal and yep. that's not what people want. So how do we, as dog trainers, how do we as dog owners encourage people to, yes, find the right dog for them, not just the dog that's in their local shelter, but, yeah. you know, the idea that, yes, I live in Vermont. Maybe <laughs> I have to go to Texas to get a dog. Maybe mm -hmm. that's where the dog that's right for me is. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not in my state. Right. You look on Facebook, you look online, everybody wants the perfect dog and they want it in the next town over. Yes. Wasn't that the name of your book, Steve? Choosing and training the dog for you, I believe. Yeah, and what about the right dog for you? Is the right dog for you? That was. Yeah, the Torah wrote that. You know. Oh, dog. okay. Mm -hmm. and I happen to think it's an excellent book, but you know, I mean, I, uh, so I, I'll be the old one for a minute. When I was in the fifties, when I was a little kid, and my mother used to take me to the shelter for lunch you know, the animal shelter with a brown bag, right? That's where we went. That was our day. We didn't have money to go to like Freedom Land. So we went to the dog shelter, As ASPCA. <laughs> Here's what I remember very clearly. All the male dogs were in one pen and all the female dogs were in another, mm. period. 
there were no individual cages with individual dogs. Mm. All the boys were there and all the girls were over here. And I remember because it was the day of everybody had a German Shepherd. And if you didn't have a German Shepherd dog, you had a Collie because, you know, Lassie. And yeah. they were there. I remember going there and saying, I'd be like, wow, Lassie's in there. You know, I was <laughs> a little, cool. you know, but they, these dogs, it's not like they were breaking up fights every minute. <clears throat> and all those dogs were intact back then. Yep. Americans yeah. have forgotten how to live oh. with intact animals. That is, mm -hmm. I have a huge mission to get people to get their dogs to adulthood without neutering them and then make a decision. But that's another huge thing. Topic. Like I said, I travel in Europe a lot. Everybody's dogs in certain countries are still intact. They're out on the streets. They're behaving. They're, I have three females that are still intact. My my two oldest bitches, one was neutered at three and a half because she had bad hips. I didn't want an accidental breeding on a mm -hmm. hybrid with bad hips, of course. And then my great Dane, I neutered her at two because she I wasn't going to breed her. She was fully grown. And having her get in her period when we needed to travel was kind of, was really inconvenient, but she was fully grown. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. I, and my male, we waited to two years as well. And he was a baby, he was a puppy 15, 16 years ago. He's gone now. So the the idea that we that all dogs must be neutered is the reasoning behind that is because all Americans are too stupid to manage their dogs. That's the expectation. We won't teach people how to manage their dogs. We'll just yeah. cut, you know, we'll just mutilate the dogs. Yeah. And that will prevent puppies. As but guess puppies. what? But this is we are <laughs> we may be killing less dogs in shelters, but we've got at least 200 percent more shelters and rescues providing right. dogs than we did right. when we had a shelter in each town when we were kids. Yep. When when I used to do presentations in schools, my dogs stay intact. My male dogs stay intact their entire lives unless they have a yeah. health concern. And um, and I only have male dogs in my house, so it's a non-issue. I don't have to worry about anything accidental, but I would take my dogs into schools and do educational programs in the schools when I lived in Maryland. And I actually had a young child point at my dog's testicles and say, what's that? And, you know, the kid was like six or seven and I'm not his parent and I don't know what he knows. So I said, oh, those are his boy parts. Because right. I don't want to start explaining terminology and, you right. know, technical words. So I just said, yeah. oh, those are his boy parts. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But I mean, they not even have know that that dogs potentially have body parts like that. Yes. You know, children. Well, that gets back to what you were saying earlier about being out of touch with nature and being out of yeah. touch with 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 the natural world. Yeah. Um, and I know that we've discussed this for a long time. Um, I actually would like to continue this discussion next time. But what I would like to dis discuss next time is what can we do about all this? Mm. Where can we go with this? I think we've really gone into this in a lot of detail, gone into a lot of different aspects of this. And I'd like to discuss what are the next steps? What do we, what do you as dog trainers and me as a dog owner, what can we do to help with the situation? So I think that that's a really good place to leave it. Um, and um, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank everybody for watching. And uh, don't forget to like us on Facebook. And please give a thumbs up to this video. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we will see you next time where we will make that discussion, have that discussion. I guess that's a better word for it. <laughs> As of what can we do about the broken dog culture? So with that, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.